radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Today is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. And tonight, John Ramirez is with us. We're going to be talking about, well, a lot of things tonight, but going to be a little bit Washington centric, a little CIA centric, a little ET and disclosure centric, a lot to cover tonight. And this is the deal. I've been uh, aware of John for quite some time. And I think that he's been very aware of fade to black and myself. And, and we've been waiting uh, for tonight's conversation. And finally, it's going to go down. John served from 1984 to 2009 in the CIA Directorate of Science and Technology, the Directorate of Intelligence, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. He served as the Chief of Site and Chief of Operations for Overseas Technical Collection Facilities and was the chief of the Electronic Intelligence Analysis Branch. He was the SIGINT specialist and the collection requirements strategist for what is now the ODNI National Counterproliferation and Biosecurity Center. During his 25-year career, he specialized in ballistic missile defense systems and the analysis of weapon system radar signatures, under the parent offices where the legacy UFO program resided. John is a member of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. That's got to be a pretty crazy group. And the CIA Retirees Association. And I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, John Ramirez. John, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's uh, great to finally have you on the show, and uh, like I said in the intro, we've been aware of each other for quite a while, and I don't know why we've waited so long, but tonight, we finally get a chance to get it done. Uh, are you ready for this? I am ready, and uh, we did meet um, person to person at Starworks USA 2021 in Laughlin, Nevada, and I just want to say that uh, my friend Mick, uh, who is a CIA retiree, is a big fan of your show. He's a fade or not. I am a fade or not. I, uh, I'm at the bacon bar <laughs> as a fade or not. And I encourage others to uh, join up. Um, it's, it's a great show that you have here. Uh, you are very good with your guests and uh, I appreciate that as well. And I hope you have a great show. And uh, Mick, thanks you for the shirt that uh, you autographed for him. You recall, I, I purchased the shirt for him. I do. And I see him in the chat right now. So he, I just want to give him a shout out to he and uh, others who are listening uh, from CIA. There's a lot of folks, I think, who are tuning in. You know, what's funny. Uh, oh, oh, first off, uh, John, you know, we've got to get the first time guest disclaimer out of the way. So uh, let's do that now. John, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. And where that conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There. You and, ready? And click. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. See, now, I actually want to start here. Um, uh, we're going to go backwards, but right. I, I kind of want to start in the now now. Okay. Um, you know, as you as you and everybody knows, I host and attend uh, all the major conferences. Mm -hmm. And one of the comments, uh, and I like to play a little game at these conferences, you know, spot the Fed. Right. And when I go... And, and say these things. Uh, okay, I'll give you an example. At the last Conscious Life Expo, I did a, a luncheon, and I had about 100 people there uh, for the luncheon, and I stood up and greeted, you know, having a good time, making everybody laugh, and I said, right now, there is a Fed in this room. 
Mm-hmm. Let's play spot. And I was watching everybody just like look at each other. Who do you think, right? And uh, now it's a game and it's fun. Sometimes it gets a little intense because people wonder, could there be? But I met you at a conference. Mm-hmm. Right. So that says to me that you guys and gals, you guys attend these conferences, don't you? We sure do. And I've attended several in the past uh, when I was still working for CIA. I didn't go on behalf of CIA. I had to pay my own way. I bought my flights. I uh, reserved my hotel rooms. I paid the conference fees. And I did all that on my own dime. And uh, the only thing I had to do is I did have to report my attendance at any conference. It doesn't have to be a UFO conference. It's just anywhere that you would go outside of the Washington, D.C. area where you have to travel the Office of Security External Activities Branch would like to know where you go. And so I submitted that, you know, I was going to a certain conference and uh, I'll be there uh, from this state to this state. Here are my flights. I'm staying at this hotel and I sent it and they come back, say, well, you know, be safe. See you later. uh, Was there ever a follow up? No, never. Nobody ever came in and said, hey, uh, you got it. Do you get any dirt at the conference? Nah, nah, no, nothing like that. Um, but we're not allowed to dig dirt in the United States unless the dirt volunteers to come to us. Right. Um, so we do have uh, something called the National Resources Division. At least it was called that in my time. It was in the Director of Operations. And the National Resources Division was the place where, like, say you have an a emigre from another country wants the volunteer information, they'll contact CIA and uh, we'll arrange to uh, speak with that person. And I can tell you that. Uh, you know, I was in an interview with a Russian immigre who had some knowledge of what we call the SA-10 surface air missile system. Uh, the Russians call it the S-300. Um, it's in operation right now in Ukraine and in Russia in the current conflict. And so here I am, you know, with the National Resources Division guys, you know, doing the questioning. Um, the gentleman spoke English. And so we're following along. And because it's a surface air missile system, that was, that was within my uh, analysis account area. So I was there in attendance as well. And uh, sitting on the side at a safe house in Northern Virginia, say that much. And he was just talking about, you know, the modes of operation of this wonderful Russian surface air missile system. And then all of a sudden he said, and, you know, there was this UFO mode. What? UFO mode. Really? And so the um, NR officer stopped and said, did you say... UFO? And said, yes, yes, UFO, uh, UFO, UFO. And, um, okay, that's interesting. So I knew that the system had a mode of operation that we could not quite understand why it was there. Because it was designed to track something going much faster than anything we had in the inventory, including the SR-71. Right. So it was designed to track something like enormously fast and we I intercepted the radar signal doing this mode of operation which we thought it was the test mode or maybe the radar is broke the radar in question is called the flap lid and so you can look it up on on um, wikipedia flap lid it's the radar associated with the s300 system and it did have this mode of operation so ufo is ufo in russian Right. I mean, it's the yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, he spoke English, but you understand what I'm yeah. saying, right? They yeah. totally get it. Yeah. Um, and, and most countries, it's uh, OV and I, uh, OVNI, you know, they right. say OVNI, um, but UFO mode. Okay. So I got more to the story, Jimmy, because, you know, I'm on to the black and I don't hold anything back. Let's no, go. No, 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 no. Let's go. Let's go. Um, so um, as part of my analysis work on the surface air missile systems, and particularly those missile systems that had a capability to shoot down ballistic missiles, our missiles, um, I would be interested in knowing about the full capabilities of it. So, you know, we acquired one of these S-300 systems um, and we brought it over to an interesting place in Nevada. And that's where all interesting places go. (laughs) And so it's in Nevada. And I can say that it was uh, about 50 miles west of Area 51 in another part of the test range, uh, which was designed uh, to set up um, testing uh, for pilots. 
against like jamming signals. So, you know, there'd be jamming signals and radars on the ground that they have to fly against and turn on their countermeasures to see how well they perform. So in this instance, here's this S300 radar um, and all of the radar accoutrements that go with it, the other auxiliary radars. Um, and sure enough, you know, they were testing from, uh, I guess they flew from Tonopah, uh, may, uh, maybe from Fallon, which is also in Nevada. That's a Naval Air Station. Um, so they were testing all kinds of aircraft against the S300. So on another hill, you know, you got, uh, you got the NSA folks collecting the signal because here you got main beam, you know, this is the real deal. You're not getting it from satellite flying like, you know, thousands or like hundreds of miles away. It's like right in front of you. So the NSA guys are in there spinning their tapes and collecting the signal. You got the Air Force guy on another hill uh, with jamming pods and he's like adjusting the jammer and seeing how the jammer works against this signal. And so fine, you know, that was the exercise and I was there as well inside the where the flap lid radar was. There's the flap lid radar above me. And also went outside and there's another radar called the clamshell, which is a, a radar that can track fast objects, a velocity radar. And so that's fine. And so one day, one evening, they told my, my partner, I, her name is Cheryl. I can use first names. We're both in the same office. And they told us that we need to get off that mountain early because it's going to be a special test and we were not cleared for it. We're not cleared for this test. And I go, huh, that's interesting because, you know, I had tickets for, you know, all of the aircraft, including all of our uh, stealth aircraft that would fly against it. But there was something special that Cheryl and I could not be a witness to. So we left the mountain early. The next morning we came up and, you know, some of the engineers there from, you know, the Betway Bandits, you know, I think they were Raytheon because Raytheon builds our radars. And they were really excited about something that occurred in the test the previous night. And uh, they thought that we were cleared and they kind of spilled a little bit about, wow, did you see like, what it did to, you know, this radar, how it performed against, you know, um, this that special aircraft. And, and all of a sudden the other guy says, shh, shh, because he realized that we may not be cleared and we were not cleared. So I knew that that previous evening, they tested something very special, uh, probably that the Air Force flew that we CIA officers with all the tickets necessary to be on that hip mountain and interface with a real Russian system. Um, we had all the tickets necessary, but except for this one special aircraft that was tested at night. And so I always wondered if that was one of our special aircraft that could be a triangle or something else that um, is not acknowledged in our inventory. Yeah. And it, then couple that with the UFO mode. I'm yeah, going, hmm, that's it, interesting. Yeah. Do, do you, um, uh, this is just a, a quick side question. Do you believe that we do have ARVs, uh, uh, you know, reproduction vehicles uh, based on designs from up there that are now our own and, and we do fly those? Well, let's, let's look at the word reproduction. Um, we know the metamaterials cannot be reproduced on this planet. Uh, we cannot re reproduce the metamaterials, and it's very essential to reproduce the metamaterials in order to make them fly like we see, that is displaying those five observables that Lou Elizondo loves to talk about. Right. So you need the metamaterials. You need to manufacture the metamaterials, and we don't know how to do that. So I would say the answer to that is, do we have alien reproduction vehicles? I hate that term. No, we do not. But do we have advanced technology displaying phenomenal aerial space characteristics, phenomenal flight characteristics that may have been sourced or inspired by that technology? And based on what I learned, uh, the, I would say the answer is a strong yes, that we do have something that displays ex extraordinary performance characteristics above and beyond whatever else is in the open inventory that is used for, and it's an important term, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or ISR. That is a great thing to uh, get on Google to research, ISR, because all of the extraordinary technologies being uh, introduced, there are ISR technologies, that is, they're spy planes, basically. We don't fly the SR-71 anymore because the Russians know how to shoot it down from the air. They have a better aircraft 
than the SR-71, and that's called the MiG-31. And we knew that MiG-31 uh, went up to 123,000 feet. It, it touched 123,000 feet and eventually had to come down. But there's a combat radius. You know, you have the net normal service ceiling. But in combat mode, they really pushed the envelope. And this thing can go 85 to 100,000 feet in combat mode. And it had a missile, the AA-9, that could look down and shoot down at the SR-71 going much faster than the SR-71. It could not outrun this missile and it could not go higher than where the MiG-31 could fly. So they completely grounded the SR-71 force, completely grounded. But there's something else there that can fly and it gets to, gets to any point on earth really quick and can do something that's golden. It's called persistent surveillance. You know, you just stand over an area of interest and not be seen. Do we have that? I think the answer is a strong yes. I, I want to, I, I really want to find out how you got into the CIA. I, that, it, without spending a whole lot of time on that subject. But before we get there, because that's that's a, that's a Jimmy personal thing. I really want to know the how uh, what what's involved with that. But before we get there, when we look at from what you just said, when we look at things like the Tic Tac and what David Fravor and others uh, from that entire carrier group um, had to have testified to, not only on this show but uh, uh, in other media outlets. Um, is do you see that as Russian or an adversarial or Chinese technology? Are they that advanced? Which is, I think, a lot more scarier than ET. Do you, do you think it's our own and Raytheon and Lockheed, or do you think it's from up there? Um, when you say up there, I, I would say, um, you know, um. I would say that you have to be very careful what government people say, because they will literally take your question and answer, give you a literal answer. They mince those words, they parse your words carefully. And I'll give you an example to answer your question. I'll give you an example. Because Dr. Kirkpatrick made a statement, opening statement in front of this Senate Armed Services Committee, emerging technologies and capabilities or emerging threats and capabilities. And he said that we have no evidence that what we're seeing is extraterrestrial. You know what he actually was saying? We have no evidence in the videos that we collected and the eyewitness testimony that we gathered that what we're seeing came from 10 to 100, 100 light years away. We have no evidence of that. But you know what? They didn't follow up and said, OK, so could they be coming from the Earth. They're coming from in and out of the ocean. They're coming in and out of like mountains. If we've seen, uh, I know if you've seen uh, Jaime Massan's videos of what he sh has uh, collected about these craft going in and out of mountains, and in and out of the ground, in and out of the ocean, are they ultra terrestrial? That is, are they within the earth in some way or, or shape or fashion? Now, no one followed up with that because all no, these so bold. Let that go. Oh, yeah, so Jill bold. Let that go. yeah, she, yeah, because yeah, she, she knows, that she knows, <laughs> could be. she knows could be. not could to be. ask that question. Yeah, I think so. And uh, so he said, there's no evidence of it being extraterrestrial, but you know, is it cis lunar? That is, cis lunar meaning between you no know, from the ground up to the moon. Is this something that you detect flying from here to the moon, maybe landing on the moon or nearby planets within our solar system? Is it that you know, instead of 10 to 100 light years away? Um, no one ever follows up on that. So he literally was telling the truth that just by looking at videos that they've collected, some of them he showed, and just by uh, eyewitness testimony, for example, the naval aviators who flew in their FA-18s at Tic Tac, um, from that evidence, can you say that, by golly, they're from outer space? And no, he's saying no, there's no evidence that he holds uh, that is any evidence of that, that they were extraterrestrial. So that's a big opening there. So I would say, you know, that, um, yes, I think that we do have craft that are non-human made, 
And I believe that that needs to be the first thing the government admits. Because forget about the grades and about experiences and about, you know, going on the craft and getting medically examined. Let's first like admit that they're non-human. And the next question, if we, the government admits that they're non-human, okay, if they're not human, who's driving them? Then that introduces the non-human intelligences that might be driving these craft and where they may actually be located. That they could be on earth, they could be in the earth, they could be under the sea. Let's have that discussion next. Following on with why are they here and what do they want with us? Exactly. Okay, so you're taking Russia and China off of the list. Yeah. Are Absolutely. You are you taking us off of the list? No, not entirely, because I know that, like I said, right. I believe we have derived the technology from the source, the source meaning the actual craft or bits of craft or maybe some inkling of how the propulsion system works, that we derive that technology and adapted it for human use. That is adapted for military human uses for the United States. I believe that's a true statement. And I believe that is why the Air Force has been very reluctant to come on board with the rest of us who are trying to push for this disclosure because they have the most to lose. They're the stakeholders that can lose everything. Any discussion of UFOs and UAPs will, might lead the shine the light back on what the Air Force has, what I described to you, a phenomenal ISR platform. And they don't want that to be revealed. So that is why that is the motivation why in the legislation um, they stipulated non-human. You know, the NDAs are lifted off of the non-human technologies associated with UAPs. They needed to fine line dice that for the Air Force to make them feel comfortable. Um, and yeah, that being makes a, a lot of sense. Being, being, makes yeah, being sense. an American patriot, uh, you know, I mean, sure. I mean, you know, I don't want to give that away to Putin. I, I, yeah. You know, I, I, you've heard me say so many times, you know, I live here in Palmdale. Yeah. And I see the crazy stuff. I'm not going to go on the air every night and go, you're not going to believe what I saw last. You know, no, I'm not going to be that guy. And I'm not going to be the pariah of Palmdale. Right. <laughs> you know, that guy. Right. I, I, and and there does need to be a line in the sand uh, to a certain point. And I, mm -hmm. and I, I do respect that. I, I really do. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and here's the other thing. So let's get, so let's get one thing out of the way right, right now for everybody. Um, both of us have been labeled disinfo agents. Yeah. And, and I have, uh, I, I carry that banner. I, I'm mm -hmm. proud of that. You know, I got to that level of, 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 of scrutiny and, and things. And, and so here we have, uh, two disinfo agents discussing these subjects uh, uh, live on the air. Mm -hmm. And when you hear that, um, I, I, I find it me personally uh, uh, endearing. Mm -hmm. because I know who I am. And if anybody oh, yeah. walked a day in my shoes, sure. they, they would get it. But um, how do you feel uh, about that label that gets thrown around? It doesn't bother me at all because like you said, you know, I stand on what I know, which is the truth. And I know I can't say everything. So if you're upset at me for not spilling all of the beans, I got to leave a few back in the can. And if you think that's this information, that's fine. I mean, I don't care. But I'm trying to tell you as much as I can in the context that I can that doesn't give away our very sensitive sources and methods. And that is sacrosanct to CIA because sources are like the people who speak to us who are committing traitor, uh, committing uh, uh, a traitor's act against their own country at the risk of their own lives and the lives of their family to provide the United States of America with information. That's a source. And right. if we reveal information that only that source has, that source and others are in jeopardy. So, you know, you tell 10 people a secret and one of them, you know, you hear is an agent and you release that information from one agent out of the 10 who out of this country knows something, uh, they're gonna round them up <laughs> and they will not have a very pleasant time 
uh, in certain basements of the world. And so we don't want that to happen. And we don't want methods. That is, how do we extract information from a country that is den a denied area? Uh, let's say North Korea, just an example, or Iran. How do we extract information from people who want to give us information without them getting caught? That's the method of extraction, data distraction. Once that's revealed, we can never use that again. It's over. It's over. It's game over. And no one will want to speak with us again. And so, you know, human intelligence is a major source of intelligence and the director of operations, that's what they do. And what I did was mostly technical collection, you know, from space satellites and from ground sensors. Um, but, you know, that's very important. So, yeah, I, I'm not going to spill everything, but there's a lot of things here that, why is it secret? I don't understand why, and I'm saying that Roswell happened, let's say Roswell happened, and there was this craft of extraordinary technology that crashed, why did that get scrolled away? All of a sudden, it was a saucer, now it's a weather balloon. Um, the only thing I could come up with is that it's something we knew about already, that it's something that maybe we exploited from German technology. Uh, we collected a lot of the uh, Wunderwaffe weapons um, that they were building, and they were not able to finish it because we bombed the crap out of their industrial base. And they brought them here. We brought they brought the scientists here, and we were able to finish some of that technology. And maybe that's what it was. And that looked like a saucer. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's not a saucer. So why did that get scrolled away? And why is it so secret? To me, if it was like extraterrestrials, let's say from another planet that came here on their craft, that uh, they made it like 40 light years away, but for some reason it got so rickety in our atmosphere, it fell apart and crashed. Um, why did that happen? You know, here's a, here's a simple yes or no question uh, as a lead up to the next question. Um, I, I just want to know my boundaries. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, gotten a phone call um, after speaking? Yes, you have. Well, not a phone call. I would say uh, I got a text message. Okay, that said, chill out. Uh, no, um, this uh, the text message said that. Um, I got several phone calls from CIA uh, concerning what you said about 2027. Oh, hold on for a second. That's that's where I take out my notepad. <laughs> notepad coming out. Um, because uh, over the last two or three years, mm -hmm. there were several, several, Mm -hmm. um, not only uh, directors of national intelligence, but ex-directors of uh, the CIA mm -hmm. and other intelligence agencies. It's, it wasn't just one specific agency, but alluded to, and a few said pretty directly mm -hmm. that we have been tracking stuff entering our solar system and into and out of our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. now, that, these are pretty interesting statements. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, uh, when you uh, you said yourself that that was part of your thing was to track stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, were you aware of anything uh, that was being tracked that wasn't ours, that was interstellar? I don't know if there was interstellar because it was within um, our space. That is, with cislunar. That is between Earth and the moon. Mm -hmm. And these are the orbs that um, the Russians saw with their radars that were designed to track satellites and also warn of ballistic missile launches from the United States. So these radars were tracking something that weren't satellites and were not ballistic missiles. And they were wondering what these objects were and in preparation for the fact that they didn't know, you know, they, they went to high alert. I mean, you expect them. There's an unknown. Here they come. Let's go to alert. And so they brought up the strategic rocket forces. They're in the continental ballistic missiles. Put them on like a higher state of alert. Whatever uh, DEFCON system they use, you know, they raised it. And because they raised it, we were able to detect the heightened awareness, which got you know the Pentagon excited, right? And the Rus Russians go, okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, you know, let's get them ready. Um, you know, we get excited as well. <clears throat> and so my job was uh, to do some analysis of that event. Um, the customer for me was the Deputy Secretary of Defense at the time. His name was John Deutsch. And um, he 
asked his briefer about you know this incident that happened in Russia. And obviously he already knew about it because he probably got briefed by the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Pentagon Intelligence Services about what happened. And he wanted CIA as a second opinion. And so fine, I got the uh, job to write the memo, did the research. And though I did not say that they were UFOs, I didn't say that. I said, it's obvious that these radars went detected something that was not a satellite and was not a ballistic missile launch. And however, I did not rule out, perhaps it is a glitch in the system, but because they raised up the uh, alert level for the missiles, I kind of said that's highly unlikely and left it at that. And um, my office mate, Dave and I, we hand delivered that memo to the office of the Deputy Secretary of Defense and gave it to his uh, chief of staff. And so there's that instance. Um, and then um, there's another instance that um, I cannot talk about because I don't have permission to talk about it. Um, but I can say that um, we're not the only country that had crashes or crash retrievals. And so I would leave it at, you know, there could be visitations or crash crashes occurring in other countries uh, that we got word of that were us reported um, through the intelligence community. And so I can say that much. And um, so I, I'm hoping as part of the disclosure uh, effort that I'm hoping will come out soon, that I'll be freer to talk about that. And then I'll be more released from the uh, restriction of talking about it because it's still very sensitive. Um, so I would say yes. I mean, I think, you know, there are other countries have had uh, visitations. Uh, I don't know if they're interstellar, but they had something of high strangeness um, visit their country and uh, maybe had some response from the military. I go back to Brazil, um, the Virginia incident that happened that uh, James Fox so brilliantly documented uh, in his movie. It's a brilliant movie. Uh, here we have the Brazilian government, that is the authorities, um, knowing something. And then James said that, you know, this looks like an Air Force plane came by and picked up everything. So there's that. Do you, do you okay, this is a two part question. Mm -hmm. The first part of it is um, when we look at the last two reports that were released, and I think the first one was mm -hmm. a, a little bit uh, more informative than the second one. Mm -hmm. that, but that being said, um, in the first report, th it was very clear. Um, it's not adversarial. It's not us. And we have an other Ben, right? Mm -hmm. That we're going to lump this stuff in uh, without saying ET, right? But if it's not us and it's not them, right? And we've got the other Ben. So we have that. Um, and clearly in the first UFO hearing with Bray and Moultrie, Mm -hmm. them saying, you know, we're, we're just trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> we, we, we don't know. Yeah. So yeah. The, the first question is, yeah. is, is that a smoke screen? Yeah. Right. Where um, our government, DOD agencies, it doesn't matter, private uh, uh, industry, um, clearly know that we are being visited uh, a lot by something that is not from planet Earth, right? They, they clearly know this, but they are saying that they don't understand. Second mm -hmm. part, you can answer this at the same time. The second part to that is, are they waiting for something external to be confirmed? NASA, the James Webb, mm -hmm. life on Mars, you know, mm -hmm. something that would uh, take the pressure off of the big reveal. Yeah, and and, and answering the second part first, uh, that's something I've always thought that that would happen. And I think, um, you know, the James Webb Space Telescope being up there, I said before in other interviews that um, just stand by the James Webb Space Telescope and we'll discover something that we knew it was there all along. And I don't know what that something is. I stated in a previous interview before the Space Telescope launched that watch out for Jupiter. That's a very interesting planet. And sure enough, the very first pictures were of Jupiter, and allegedly they Jupiter pictures were leaked, quote unquote. 
Um, so there's that. And so could there be something that uh, NASA would find? Uh, I think NASA already knows. I think they've been, they've been like airbrushing stuff out for decades that they know, and they've put their astronauts um, under a non-disclosure agreement that they can't speak about what they saw and witnessed. And I think that data is at NASA. And uh, to the first part of your question, um, absolutely, um, they know more than what they state. And so uh, as far as, you know, using the word extraterrestrial, um, they might know that, you know, a lot of this phenomenon is kind of earth centric and that is it's something that's not human but not flying from way out here to come here that it could be resident on the planet and so that therefore it's not extraterrestrial so when dr kirkpatrick says well we don't have no evidence of it being extraterrestrial is he someone should ask well okay how what about the stuff coming out of the ocean um are they terrestrial are they like non-humans who are terrestrial you know, and I think he might know the answer to that, but no one bothered to ask. I would love to be a congressman just for a second. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And be on the panel. So that's the best way I can answer that. Um, I think there's a lot more that they know. Uh, I believe that uh, real soon now that uh, much more will be talked about. And again, they the government must admit that non-human intelligences are um part of this key part of this phenomenon that what's flying is non-human that's the biggest emission and then we can forget about everything else and start there and build from there um nicap which mm -hmm. was the first uh I, I should say national but uh it was a big organization uh was formed in 1956 and largely at that time uh, the board of directors, uh, this was a civilian independent of the air force UFO investigation, uh, organization, much like MUFON is today. Um, but NICAP originally was, uh, a lot of Navy, uh, ex admirals and, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, uh, were part of the organization. And then in the sixties, the CIA came in. Mm -hmm. and really got involved with NICAP. Mm -hmm. And so now we're talking about, you know, over 50 years ago that the CIA has been actively uh, looking at data and looking at uh, uh, UFO, um, and not only incursions, uh, but the other things that go along with it. it. That has to be continuing to this day. Oh, yes. Um, it started even before then. It started in 47, probably in 45, when um, we um, when uh, then the OSS was stood down. And then in 46, we had the Central Intelligence Group, which later became CIA. Um, you know, we had the Trinity uh, incident that occurred that uh, was brilliantly researched by Jacques Vallée and Paola Harris, who wrote the book Trinity. Right. Uh, something that occurred, you know, uh, very shortly uh, after the first atomic weapon was detonated in Trinity, New Mexico, that site in Trinity. So I think the CIA has been involved even before then. In fact, I think they were involved since 1947. I mean, at the very beginning, um, there was an office called the uh, Office of Research and Estimates. There was a scientific intelligence branch that had the UFO portfolio in it from the Roswell days. And that, that branch, scientific intelligence, became an office of its own, Office of Scientific Intelligence. And in that office, there was a gentleman named Ed Taus who designed the disinformation campaign in 1952. That was his job because UFOs were seen over DC and he said, oh my gosh, there they are. Um, we need to discourage any interest by the public in what flew over DC we need to start right now right here and cia your job is to go out there and deny everything and disparage any witnesses and just disrupt any studies by the civilians meanwhile you know back inside the building we're going to study it in depth and so that's what started in 52 and it's been going on ever since so no, 52 office of scientific intelligence then it was 
other offices, uh, Office of Scientific Weapons Research. I was in that. Uh, Weapons Intelligence, Nonproliferation, Arms Control, that, that center. I was in that. And it was in OSWR that um, uh, I saw a report of high interest, uh, to go back to your earlier question, about an incident that occurred in a foreign country regarding UFOs. And that was back in uh, the 90s, 94, I think. And then uh, when I was in uh, WINPAC, uh, that's when the orb working group started, when the NRO sensors that now had infrared capabilities start seeing these orbs, they're orange, uh, flying in formation over Russian space. And so, you know, was it Russian? Was it Chinese? We ruled out Russia and China. That's what my branch did. My engineers ruled out plasma stealth generators we knew that the Russians were experimenting on on some of their aircraft. And we ruled that out. And the NRO didn't check their software on the ground, check the spacecraft up in space. Everything is fine. They looked at that and go, yeah, it can't be that. So what is going on? So they started a working group. And they briefed, uh, you know, the alphabet soup agencies and in intelligence community, which then in turn brought in the contractors, which we all know well, you know, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, those guys. Um, and they they had meetings about the orbs. And I know that the orb working group had everything to do with UFOs and our knowledge up to that point. Up to that point, and they it was totally about UFOs and the orb association with UFOs. And then that was before OSAP, because that study stopped around 2006, 2007, as uh, Senator Reid and Senator Inouye uh, both started funding, um, you know, OSAP. And Robert Bigelow came in and so forth and so on. So we know the rest of the story. But, you know, that was part of that whole study that never stopped, never it, stopped. It was so he have no idea how brilliant that was, because that it, it was my next question. Because that takes us all the way through to today, yeah. where you have the UAP task force and mm -hmm. part of that, and in the budget for 2022 and 2023, very, like, written into law. Yes. All of the agencies, all mm -hmm. of them, will share their data. Right. Is the CIA, now we know that the, the United States Air Force is not, right? There's That's still, right. There's a lot of arm twisting going on. Yep. Is is the CIA, um, uh, NSA, NRO, um, and you have uh, uh, the Navy, uh, of course, the Army, the Marines, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are they all, you know, their, uh, uh, their intelligence uh, mm -hmm. divisions? Are they sharing their information? Is the CIA sharing their information that they have been collecting? Uh, let me answer it this way. Um, Dr. Kirkpatrick gave you a big clue that he is facing an uphill battle with some of these agencies. And the reason why is that the Pentagon is under something called U.S. Code Title 10. So the set of laws that governs the management of the Uniformed Armed Services, Title 10. And he is in the Pentagon serving the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, who then serves the Secretary of Defense, who answers to the president. Now, it's the CIA side. You have the director of CIA who answers to uh, Avery Haynes, the DNI, who then answers to the president. And so if there's any kind of like uh, resistance to sharing information, uh, what the Biden administration did was they gave the UAP portfolio also to the National Security Council under Jake Sullivan. And so whereas Avril Haines, even though she's DNI, she has to call the White House to schedule a meeting with the president. And, you know, what's the president calendar like? I would like to meet with him for 15 minutes to discuss something very urgent. Right. Well, Jake Sullivan just needs to walk in the door. So you have a UAP guy now in the White House just walks under the door. And he, because he is in the National Security Council, uh, working directly for the president and speaks for the president on all things matters, national security, uh, he can say, CIA, share data. And CIA will have to share data. There's been some resistance. I understand right. there's been some resistance uh, with sharing data to the UAP task force uh, under a previous director, deputy director of science and technology. Um, did not want to share data uh, with 
uh, a member of the UAP task force and actually told the member of the UAP task force, I don't have to share anything with you. And basically kicked them out of the office, right? Well, why so, has that climate changed, John? I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, when that occurred, right. the laws were not as strong as they are now. Right. It's, now it's, we have it in black and white. Right. You know, we have, you know, CIA, uh, NRO, NSA, NGA, all of these alphabet soups, you know, start sharing data. And so Kirkpatrick is still facing some uphill battle uh, of trying to get stuff from the Title 50 civilian community, intelligence community. So people look at intelligence as this big monolith. You know, it's all the Pentagon. It's not. Boy, there are like competing and competitive um kind of associations uh, regarding everything to do with the Pentagon, including UAP. So in that, some areas, it is cooperative relationship. Right. When it benefits, the agency's cooperating. And when it doesn't benefit one, uh, there's a lot of resistance. So it's competitive. And so, you know, that's why they needed at the White House, they needed someone to referee these disagreements with the authority to do so. And so I believe that um, that is the reason why everyone is now on board. And at the CIA, I know that there are liaison officers. I know two gentlemen by name, I won't name them, not even by first name, uh, that I knew uh, when I was working, they were much more junior when I was there. Uh, they're now in senior positions and they are the liaison to the arrow. The, the I think that there was a very historic moment uh, two, two and a half years ago, two years ago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when in the White House press room, they're doing a live, uh, you know, press mm -hmm. conference about all things. And then somebody asked about the, the UAP report. And from the podium, UFO mm -hmm. was said out loud. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And I thought, wait a minute. This is we are in a brave new world now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That just happened inside of the White House, live national television. Mm -hmm. UFO was just said without mm -hmm. laughter. Mm -hmm. Is is that when you say everybody's on board, is it like that now? Well, in Washington, DC, where UFO and UAP is 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 actually used in conversation? Um I would say yes, within the offices that deal with the subject matter, yes, I would say that's a true statement. In fact, um, you know, it was Avril Haynes in the uh, November, as it 2021, uh, she had the, uh, it was that panel discussion at the National Cathedral, Our Future in Space, Yes, where she said, you know, we have to consider also that they may be coming to us extraterrestrially. And I don't know if people caught it, but uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick himself in the most recent hearing he actually stated that we have bins, you know, and uh, one of the one of these bins is the extreme extraterrestrial bin. And he, he said it there. Um, and that's something that uh, Mr. Uh, Moultrie and Bray did not say, but he said it that we you know they're looking at all possibilities. Um, so yeah, right. he, he may not have the evidence now, but he's not discounting it. So I think the, the answer is yes, it, it's, it's it is a new climate. And there's no stigma, I think, involved inside the intelligence community to talk about this. Now, now uh, Chris Mellon gave us an interesting clue as to how pervasive UAPs are, because he actually revealed in the debrief article exposing the uh, Air Force as being the uh, kicking and screaming uh, partner in all this, and they don't want to go there. He also stated that, you know, the Air Force has had a campaign to, you know, intimidate people in the Air Force. They're looking at a database, a SharePoint database that contains information about UAPs and UFOs that the DNI set up. It is uh, the equivalent of UFO Twitter for those who have top secret SCI clearances. My understanding is in that database, individuals are talking about their personal experiences with the phenomenon, talking about professional encounters with the phenomenon. And they're also inserting like documents into the into that database. And then because it's TSSCI, those aren't redacted. And so even within the DNI, you know, there's a lot more openness involved.
In, in, in that article, uh, I just interrupted you, John, but I'm That's looking okay. at the clock. I, I want your response to this. In that article, which I read dozens of times uh, mm-hmm. by Chris Mellon, it was it was long, first off. It was very wordy, mm-hmm. but it was to the point, and it was well-written. And in that, when he addresses what you're talking about here, mm-hmm. he said that this is a secured chat room system, right? And, mm-hmm. and um And that in the beginning, the Air Force had Mm -hmm. their own personnel that was, you know, getting involved in these chats. Mm -hmm. And he said the Air Force stepped in. He said everybody was involved, right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the Air Force stepped in and said, no. Yeah. (laughs) No more Air Force in this this classified chat room. Right. Why would the Air Force jump? And the Air Force never denied that, by the way. And Mm -hmm. Chris Mellon put that, uh, published that. Yes. Uh, Why do you think the Air Force jumped in and said, no, 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 you can't? Yeah, like I said, you know, they're the guys that are kicking and screaming about this because they are the stakeholders with the most to lose. And what do they have to lose? Um, They're very fearful that the um, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance spy plane that ex- exhibit extraordinary capabilities uh, might be exposed. And that's that's their concern. And they don't want any conversation about this because, because I believe that that technology, it may not be accurately reproduced, but there were technologies that inspired the design. They don't want any of that to get out. So, you know, let's squash anything with UFOs, UAPs in it. Because we know that you know we use that we utilize that. Isn't that, that weak though? Isn't that a weak excuse? That's that's, uh, that's the way the Air Force thinks. I mean, they're they're just like you know they're putting up walls and putting up barriers, um, you know. And they, is it they don't... because they've always been the gatekeepers? Um, I can say this: that the Air Force has been a primary gatekeeper, and I would raise my hand as a former CIA officer, and so has the CIA. And I would think that in in, in the early days of Roswell. Um, we had, you know, the U.S. Army Air Forces that became the Air Force, and we had the Central Intelligence Group that became the CIA. And there are the two organizations that were most involved with whatever crashed at Roswell. And they've been there since day one to protect this information. But where we differ is that I think the CIA is now becoming more open to the idea that maybe it's time now to... Uh, release what we have because we don't we don't bend metal as they say in the defense community bending metal means you know you're bending airplanes at palmdale we we don't we don't do that anymore um but we do study it from more i think more from the believe it or not the higher consciousness um the uh experiencer type this high strangeness type of perspective and that's what fueled like the remote viewing program. And it fueled some of the MK Ultra program, which was not so much about mind control, but behavior modification. And so the very first MK Ultra program was actually called Project Chatter. It was aligned with the CIA and the Navy in 1947, Chatter. Um, and you, we keep hearing that, you know, the beings t- communicated telepathically. And likely the CIA want to know how did that work? Because my God, if we can communicate telepathically, we can talk to our agents that way, you know, telepathically. It's secure and we can do remote viewing. We can, we don't have to risk the lives of an operations officer or an agent to go somewhere. We can remote view it. We can consciously send our minds someplace and look at top secret stuff being worked on by another country. And so a lot of that is within the CIA preview, purview. And that is what we call the weird desk. The weird desk at CIA was all about telekinesis, psychoenergetics, um, these types of topics. The high strangeness part. Man, it's a lot cheaper than paying somebody's salary. It, 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 <laughs> it, well, you don't have to pay somebody to fly overseas and, and be yeah. there for a year if you could do it from a desk at, you know. Well, it's not even the cost. I mean, you know, it's, well, it's, but you it's understand the safety. What I'm yeah. Yeah, you know, safety, safety of the sure, person. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, all of that. All of that comes into play. Um, okay, let me ask you this really quick. Um, uh, I ask Avi Loeb the same question. Uh-huh. That if Avi discovered something, 
Mm-hmm. I mean, the 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 the, the thing, right? What it, whatever it may be, but the, the thing, uh, or somebody else. Would there be, you know, obviously civilian, right? That's mm-hmm. that's private. Mm-hmm. Would there be a government takeover of that information? Does the CIA come in? Does the NRO? Does DOD, ODNI? And and take control of it like the James Webb, like the mo- it, it, the movie Contact, right? Where mm-hmm. the, it, they would keep this information from the public in the interest of national security. Is that possible in this day of information? I don't think so. Um, that can't happen. Um, and in fact, uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick said that he is working with academia as part of Arrow. He's bringing academia into Arrow to share what he can with academia, because um, there's a lot more expertise out there than what's inside the government. And we have some really smart people uh, working in the government, but again, you know, their worldview is somewhat constrained by the fact that they are in government and what we need are uh, open minds outside of government to look into this issue. And I believe Dr. Kirkpatrick and Errol uh, will be doing that. And in fact, Dr. Kirkpatrick, what did he do? The guy who heads Errol co-authored a paper with Avi Loeb. And I don't think that would have happened like two years ago, even. But well, why didn't why didn't Jill Brand bring that up? I think um she didn't want to bring it up in open session. I would not be surprised that, you know, in closed session, there was a lot more some substantive discussion going on. And uh so again, I'm I'm hoping that whatever is going on behind closed doors will come out out into the open. And I'm hoping that there is a um, disclosure, initial initial disclosure that will happen real soon now, because there's absolutely no sense to keep anything uh, under a tight lid. It really isn't. Um, I don't know what justification they have to keep it under a tight lid. Other than the Air Force, we've got something that's really cool that we don't want anyone to see. Um, okay. But everything else, I mean, why? Why, why do that? Because... This stuff doesn't belong to the U.S. government or any government. It belongs to humanity. It belongs to the world. And we need to release it into the world. I keep saying the American government needs to get out of the UFO monopoly that it has had since the 40s. They need to support initiatives internationally. And one of the things that we would like, uh, the folks who are pushing for disclosure, um, is to support San Marino and Project Titan where they would want everything to be under the United Nations. Well, that's, that's such a great point in that um, I feel that our international cooperation in space, as, as you know, considering all the other issues that we have geopolitically on this planet, that when it comes to space, you know, we've had Soyuz and Roscosmos flying our astronauts. Mm-hmm. We've been using their engines. There's been a general cooperation in the sharing of knowledge of of uh, space travel and exploration it's it's been pretty cool is the same thing going on with ufo and et information is there international cooperation there or is everybody keeping everything close to the chest no i think there is international cooperation i do and um you know it happens i mean it, it does happen um does that cooperation extend to the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation? I can't answer that. There's a lot of things we don't cooperate about, but we, there in the past we did. Um, you'd be surprised as to you know how much level of cooperation we do have, even with our adversaries, that there is some level of communications. We don't cut everybody off. Um, and some people says, well, you never disclose anything top secret. Well, why is it top secret? I mean, that's just a stroke of a pen. You know, I mean, anything top secret can be declassified in an instant by the stroke of a pen of the president of the United States. He has the authority, original classification authority, to unclassify anything, declassify anything. And so that's within his purview. And that's what's happening now. We're saying that, you know, we don't want this to be top secret anymore. There's no reason for it to be top secret. Okay, you're going to hide your fancy airplane. That's fine. You know, hide it, you know, hide your triangles, you know. I I get that. Yeah, I do, too. Okay. And, but everything else, why is it? I don't think it's top secret. And people say it's a fantasy that you're going to disclose. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I just can't wait. 
I just can't wait uh, toward uh, around the holiday season. Okay. And I want you to say that to my face again, that uh, you're not going to disclose anything, that you're a disinformation agent because uh, 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 I told you so. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that right yes. after the break. Uh, stay right there. John Ramirez is our guest. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. And we'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church, and I want to introduce you to LifeWaves X39 Stem Cell Activation Patch, which has totally transformed my health, my sleep, brain, and my eyes. I no longer need reading glasses. X39 is a true breakthrough in regenerative science. Using light, X39's patented age reversal technology is clinically proven to signal the activation of younger stem cells, accelerating the body's natural healing process. X39 promotes restoration and rejuvenation, bringing the life-changing benefits that I've experienced. By naturally elevating a master signaling peptide in the body, X39 boosts vitality, health and wellness, and resets 4,000 genes to a younger, healthier state. It's one patch, once a day, and you can turn back time with X39. Just go to HealingWorksNow.com. That's works with an X. HealingWorksNow.com. Hey, everybody. It's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a Lifetime Achievement Award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixer with celebrity guests. Shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's going to be a night to remember. You don't want to forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I want to see you there. Forbidden Conscious Awards 2023. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, John Ramirez. And I'm X39. I keep it right here in the studio. I'm wearing it right now. It's right here. Wear it on the base of my neck. I, I got my vision back. Look at my face. I'm healthy. I'm rested. My brain is clear for guests like John Ramirez. And, and now, John, um, I how how do you get into the CIA? Do, do you get recruited? Do you fill out a job application? How, how, how does that happen? Well, right now, um, the, I think the easiest way to get into CIA is to just go on their website and uh, they have all the jobs uh, advertised uh, that you might qualify for. Um, you know, the stipulation is you, know, you got to be a U.S. citizen. That, that's that's number one. Uh, we don't hire Russian citizens or Chinese citizens or, you know, Brazilian citizens or U.S. citizens. So that's one. Uh, you have to be 18 years minimum. That's two. And a third, uh, you should not have an outstanding warrant or a felony conviction in your record. So that's it. Now, the rest is like qualifications. That is technical qualifications. And there's a whole list of jobs that you might qualify for. Some of them do stipulate a degree 
Not all jobs at CIA require a college degree. Uh, we have like trade skills. Uh, we have automobile mechanics who take care of the fleet of limousines that the directors and deputy directors get to ride in. So we have a motor pool and there are people there that you know specialize in uh, being professional drivers or fixing automobiles. Um, we have uh, other jobs that are related to logistics and whatnot and supply uh, that may not require a college degree, but in more, more than more, in most instances, a college degree is required uh, in one of the fields that CIA is recruiting into. So there's the job um, webpage at CIA.gov. Um, secondly, um, CIA goes to campuses across the United States. And they recruit there at college fairs, like all the other companies do, competing with the talent offered by that particular college university. Uh, and I've been to uh, college campuses. My favorites are in like USC and UCLA. I like going out to California, uh, mainly because uh, there's a wonderful hamburger stand at uh, Rampart and Rampart and ah, I forget the other one, but. Um, that's okay. There's a great, if you see this shack, take it back. You know what I'm saying? Jimmy? You know which one I'm talking about. Uh, Tommy's. Tommy's. Thank you. Yes. The best. Uh, yes. A to if you haven't had a Tommy burger, you hadn't had a burger. I, I wear uh, my Tommy shirt here on fade to black at least once a month. Uh, uh, wow. Okay. You just went up a level uh, there. Yeah. John. Oh, but I, love, I, I love that. I, so, and, you know, and how did campuses you do it? Um, I actually uh, was writing to CIA was serving in the Navy. I served in the Navy between 73 and 79. And I was in a job that required a clearance. And it was um, electronic warfare. So I knew a lot about radar signals and uh, how to jam radar signals. I was a skill set that CIA was interested in. So I, I queried, you know, made a job query about what opportunities there might be for somebody with my background. And said, yes, we do have opportunities. However, we recommend you get a college degree. Uh, prior to uh, contacting us again. So I got out of the Navy, uh, went to the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., majored in political science, but I had a technical background through the Navy. And so I was hired into the, I applied through a, actually a Washington Post ad in the Sunday edition. No. They wanted uh, military signals intelligence expert apply here, right to us. So I did. And I was scheduled for a series of interviews, uh, which culminated in a background investigation and a not very pleasant polygraph, uh, which is called a full scope polygraph. They get into every details, detail of your life, uh, even personal details of your life. Uh, that, yes, that means sex. Yes. Um, they want to know everything. They want to know, you know, what turns you on, you know, <laughs> literally, uh, their, their idea is that we're going to share with you the most secret information in the United States government. We feel that you should share your most personal information with the United States government. You know, let's let it be an exchange. And they also want to know if there's anything in your background that could be used against you that you're hiding. Um, so, I mean, you know, if if a gentleman likes to wear uh, ladies' clothing, they don't care as long as you admit it to CIA. Literally, they don't care because then if a foreign intelligence service says, well, we're going to tell your employer that you like to wear women's clothing. And the guy would say, I don't care. CIA already knows. So yeah, they already know. that stipulation. Right. So, I mean, that's how that's why they get into such uh, details about one's personal life. And you get through that. And most people fail the poly. That's why there's a cleansing out of the applicants because they fail that polygraph. Um, and then after that, um, you'll get a phone call saying we adjudicated your case. Uh, just pick a day you show up. I picked June 18, 1984. That's the day I started my career. And on uh, September 30, uh, 2009 was the uh, my second happiest day was leaving the CIA. I took off my badge. I badged out, took off my badge, gave it to the uh, security officer and said, I don't need this anymore. I retired. See ya. <laughs> and I walked out the door. And I only been back once. I only been back once for a uh, reunion in August of 2016. Now um, we're we're going to get back to UFOs, uh, yeah. everybody. Just just relax. But I got to ask: Is it is getting into the building and wandering around the building? Is it like what we see on TV? It, 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 can, uh, 
as a civilian, you're probably not going to get through the front gate into the parking lot, right? Without being on some kind of list. Jimmy, you're a U.S. citizen with a Social Security number, right? Right. And if I was still a CIA officer and I wanted you to invite you to for lunch at CIA, I just put in a gate pass. Jimmy Church, here's his social uh, place of birth, date of birth. Put it in. It gets approved. You drive up. They give you a badge. It's a visitor's badge. And you I can, go in the the cafeteria. I can go to the CIA cafeteria. Can I get a hat? Do you guys uh, have we, a we shop? Do, we it's do a... have a uh, employee store that you can get hats. Shut up. Can you can you get that set up? I'm I'm, I'm down for that. You want to? You want to? I'd fly out tomorrow. No, you don't have to. Uh, the the uh, store is online. <laughs> the store's online. <laughs> yeah, everything's online, man. Uh, but is, online. Is, is it like that though? Uh, you know, going through the building, you're, you know, um, I would say that um, there are very few that actually show our front lobby. Um, the most accurate um, is the. I I don't know who puts it out. Is it Prime Video? But uh, there's the Jack Ryan series. And at the very first episode, you know, season one, episode one, it shows him uh, riding his bicycle and parking it in front of the building. Now, that's not going to happen. I'm telling you that the, <laughs> only VIPs get to do that. And then he walks into the building and it actually showed the lobby of the building and they actually show him badging in correctly. And then they show him walking through the corridor. And that is an actual corridor of CIA. And I freeze frame some of the uh, the door um, labels for the office vault numbers, and they're accurate. That's exactly the way we do it. Wow. Um, well, it starts with the floor number, and it could be like seven, which is the seventh floor, the top floor where the director is. The next is the corridor name, which is might be D as in Delta, and then the vault number, which could be, I don't know, 64. So 7D64, that's a legitimate uh, office uh, designation for an address, and it's either NHB for new headquarters building or OHB for original headquarters building. The one that was, um, I think, was built uh, uh, in the 59, 60 era that you mostly see, but the new building was uh, in the 80s. So that's it, you know. Um, I, I, so, just, yeah. I, I find it fascinating. I, I really do. And, and thank you for answering that. Um, it, it is, it's, it's a, a situation where, um, going through, uh, the building and you see there's, this is the last question on this, where, uh, somebody is going to go into their office and they scan their badge to get into their own office. And then in their own office, they have a safe. Yeah. Is, is that just Hollywood? You, you don't scan into a batch to get into an office. You scan into the building, and once you're in the building, you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere you want. Yeah, you got your you got your blue badge. Right. The blue badge is a picture against a field of blue. There is an alphanumeric designation under the badge. It usually starts with two alphabetic uh, letters followed by three digits, and that's it. There's no name or anything on it, and so it would be like ZZ. 999. That's a CIA badge. It has a picture of Jimmy Church on it. Yeah. Right. And right. on the back, it actually says, if found, please put, drop it in the nearest post, post box and it will be returned to the U.S. postmaster or something. I don't know. That's what it used to say in, in my time. And now that we have community badges, ODNI badges, um, in fact, if my badge uh, toward the end of my career when the ODNI was stood up, uh, my badge could actually get into any building in the intelligence community in the DC area. So I can go up to NSA and badge in, uh, punch in my secret number. Right. So it's a badge plus a number. And oh, there goes the turnstiles. I walk into NSA and just wander around. As long as I wear that badge, no one's going to stop me. Uh, I can go to NRO. Uh, I can go to NGA. I can go to any building. Uh, it's part of the intelligence community, including DNI headquarters. Um, no one stops you as long as you have the badge. Uh, blue is for government staffers, we call them blue badgers, that's us. And green is for contractors, that's in-house contractors. Those who work in the buildings because they have a contract with that agency. Does not include like the guy who's out there in El Segundo working for aerospace. Right. You know, right. That, that he won't have that unless he frequently visits one of these buildings and then he, they might get him, get him a badge that has building access. And so that's all there is to it. And you know, it's 
you, we don't badge in. Um, you, you just punch us uh, uh, some uh, numbers and some buttons to get in. That's it. Man. Yeah, it's it, everything is a vault. Every, the entire building is a skiff except for the hallways and the cafeteria. Yeah, cell phones? No cell phones. Um, right, back right. in my time, uh, you leave your cell phone in your car. And in fact, you turn off your cell phone in your car. Problem is, you know, no smart watches because, you know, they have geolocation and cell phones have geolocation. You can actually locate where that cell phone is. So you can track that cell phone number and say, hey, this guy is you know, parked at the CIA headquarters. Don't want that. So you turn off all of that stuff. So and, Jack, um, Jack Ryan. Yeah. Right, that's, uh, using his cell phone in nah. the CIA cafeteria. That ain't no, happening. no, no. That doesn't happen, though. People do have authorized cell phones. They did issue cell phones. Um, there are authorized cell phones that are checked out by the Office of Security. Okay. That's, I don't want to get you in any more trouble. Nah, but... it's, it's, it's nothing like that. I mean, by golly, I mean, there are college students right now who are sophomores at USC who are like working at CIA over the summer, you know, they're, and they're, they're like 19, 20 years old and we clear them for top secret SCI. I mean, that's wow. that much access, a college student. And we're hoping that the college student will work for us, but he's under no obligation to continue. So he's got all these wonderful tickets. And what they usually do is they apply to CIA, get one of these wonderful tickets and he's an aerospace engineer. And, you know, we're only paying him this much, but you know, if he takes this top secret clearance from CIA and it's good for like, I don't know, five years, um, he can then market that to like North Ark Grumman. You know, sure. Say, hey, sure. yeah, you know, I got this top secret. And all of a sudden, North Ark Grumman has to pay him the big bucks for having that top secret clearance. So we have a lot of uh, college kids that run through the building and usually have no intention of making a career. And then they go find more lucrative jobs elsewhere, similarly to uh, retirees like us you know, getting contacted on the phone 18 months after we leave. That was the rule back in my day. Right. Uh, we get a, con a call and then, and I was flabbergasted by how much money was thrown at me just because I had a top secret clearance. Uh, but I, yeah, I didn't, exactly. I didn't want to work there anymore. I just forget it. I don't want, I'm done. And, uh, and the, uh, uh, you have mentioned a couple of times tonight on the show uh, about the feeling of something eminent. Yeah. And now uh, you threw three numbers out. You said yeah. in, in in months. Yeah. You said the, by the end of the year. And mm -hmm. then you mentioned 2027. Yes. Okay. Th th that's not that broad, but no. in, in a sense, it, it kind of is. So in the short term, when you say three to four months, what do, what do you expect? To, um, let's see. What is it now? It's... Um... We're almost in, May, right? Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, l let me say uh, months, meaning like sometime in the calendar year before the holiday season. Before? Before the holiday season, 2023. Before November, before Thanksgiving. Yeah, let's let's say that. Thanksgiving, Christmas, holiday season. Uh, sometime uh, in that area of the calendar, uh, there may be, uh, there's an opportunity to have perhaps a disclosure event. I don't know, because I'm not managing it at all. Um, but I get wind that, you know, something like that might happen. And the 2027 is, is something completely different. Okay. We'll um, come back to 2027. I'm not letting you mm -hmm. off that easy, John. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's, let's go. When you say the wind, what is the wind telling you? The wind? Yeah. You said there's something in the wind. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's happening in the near term, uh, during this calendar year, I think it is it's going to culminate into some kind of event or some announcement or I don't know how it's going to be portrayed. I don't know because I'm not managing this the process, but there will be an opportunity for uh, current and former government officials to come forward and disclose at least at a minimum that what is flying, what we're seeing. Uh, represents non-human technology, that it was not built by humans. That much is a huge deal for the government, which has been saying that we don't know what it is, if it's serial, this and that or whatever. We, we have no idea when they do have an idea. And I think they will reveal that, yes, we do have an idea and we know that it's non-human, that that will lead to other opportunities for the government to come forward. 
the most important thing, the reason why they want to do it so quickly now mm -hmm. is they want this to be part of the 2024 political process for the president, the primary campaigns, the debates in front of the mainstream media correspondents of being able to bring up this question in that type of forum where before you get the giggles, right? No one wants to say anything and nobody wants to answer the question because they don't want to be cast as, you know, oh my gosh, this guy is crazy. He believes in ETs and UFOs. Well, suppose, you know, um, one of the people that will come forward used to be a head of an intelligence agency at a high position, either the director or deputy director or the secretary or undersecretary of a major department, let's say defense, just to pick one. And so this person says, I know that, you know, what's been visiting us is non-human. We've known it all along. And I used to be the former da 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 secretary of whatever. All right. Now I was a journalist, you know, if you're a journalist, I, I know you would, and you, you know, thank you, Mr. So-and-so. And I would move that microphone over to the current person who occupies that position. So, hey, you know, Mr. So-and-so, who you're now secretary of this, your predecessor in the previous administration or two said that he knows that what we are seeing in the skies represents non-human technology. He stated it for the record. What do you know? That puts that guy in a hot spot, doesn't it? Because if he says, I don't know, I don't can't say anything, he's going to look awfully stupid. And that is the purpose of getting it out into the open soon, because then to make it part of the presidential process, we would want the mainstream media correspondents of the major news organizations to ask these candidates, you know, what do you feel about the UAP issue? Because, you know, all of these former government people who served in previous administrations of previous presidents said this, for the record, if you become president and you then appoint a secretary of this or that, you know, what is your position on the UAP issue? That's a serious question now. And that's what we want to happen. And that opens up more disclosure. That opens up an opportunity for the 2024 winner of the presidential campaign to be the disclosure president, an opportunity for that person to disclose everything. So in order to for that to happen, we have to pass that big hurdle that has been hinted at, but we're not there yet. Non-human technology, non-human craft, non-human pilots. We need to at least address that as disclosure which is a huge thing for the government to say after decades of denying everything. Um, and if that happens, then I am very hopeful that it will open everything up and have more serious discussions about what we're seeing, why they're here, and our role in this. You know, that what is our role? Why are they visiting us, us puny humans on a in this, you know, nondescript rock that's third from this, you know, ordinary sun? and the Orion spur of one of many galaxies. You know, why us? You know, we want that to be, to be answered as well. It will teach us a lot about who we are as humans. It will teach us a lot about humanity. And I'm hoping that um, that we'll learn to take care of our planet better uh, because they, they are showing up because of nuclear weapons. That's the principal reason they're showing up. It seems nuclear that weapons. way. It, it seems that way, John. And that's such an excellent point. And and I believe that it's an excellent point because we have careers that last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. But a politician's run and certainly an administration's run is eight years at its longest. Mm -hmm. Right. And so whatever is going on career wise as an agenda across the board. Mm hmm. Is, is something that will continue after the president leaves office. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, you would need to approach it that way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it is, that's probably the most important uh, point to bring forward here is that this has been going on for a very long time, but presidents yeah. come and go. And right now, this is where we're at. And, therefore, we need to make this part of the, the next administration. Exactly. Exactly. And all administrations henceforth. 
Uh, we are living in the disclosure era. We truly are. And my my uh, my humorous uh, take on it is: What do all the ufologists do when everything gets disclosed? <laughs> what do they do for a living? You know, <laughs> we already we already told you everything. What do you do now? You know, what yeah. books are you going to write? <laughs> I, I get that all the time. I do. Um, I, I get an email or a comment at least once a day. Jimmy, you know, after disclosure, what are you going to do for a job? And, <laughs> and and my answer to that, is, what do you mean? Now we've got everything to talk about. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, I yeah. agree with you, John. It, it all just blows wide open. It, it does. And, and, and it will bring the planet together for yeah. sure. I, I want us to be a spacefaring planet. Big fan of Star Trek, and I want us to be a spacefaring planet. And I'll just for all you Star Trek fans out there, the Disclosure episode, the original series, season two, episode twenty-six. It was called Gary Seven. Watch that episode. There is more disclosure in that one episode than all the other Star Treks combined since. Okay, and because so that incorporates said. everything. Original series episode twenty seven. I'm gonna watch yeah, episode uh, season two episode twenty six. Oh, oh, season two. Okay, episode twenty six. Oh, you. it's got everything. It's got a, a uh, it's got uh, uh, non human intelligences picking up people from the earth, taking them somewhere, bringing them back. It's got time travel. It's got everything in there, and it also has that nuclear reason why they're visiting us. Because uh, I won't give away the plot if you haven't seen it, but there's a nuclear aspect to it. I'm going to go back and watch it uh, tonight uh, after the show. Okay, now let's get to 2027. Yeah. And and maybe you'll get another text tonight after the show. But I I'm hope not. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Now, I'll, I'll say this much. Um, that year has come up in a classified setting in a skiff that I was in in Washington, D.C. I was asked, John, what have you heard from about 2027 and this phenomenon. And I go, well, oh, that's interesting. You know something about 2027. So what I said was, I understand that experiences have been talking about 2026, 2027. Um, and they know that something might be happening. Maybe it's that. Um, I, and I said, what I hope would happen is that by 2027, if all the disclosure happens, that the beings who are already here on the planet will then find an opportunity to arrive in some big, big way that you can't deny they're here. You know, it's like that movie Arrival, that here they are, <laughs> here they are. And so I hope that would happen. And that's what I said as my opinion. But the interesting thing is that in this skiff of the United States government, the year 2027 came up in a question to me about a, an event in the future. They didn't tell me what they thought about it. They asked me what I thought about it, and I gave them uh, my thoughts about it. And, you know, that's been talked about by other guests that you had. Uh, um, I would I would uh, share something that I, I recently got approval to share. Let's go. And, okay, so you had a guest, Anjali, right after she had her appearance at the uh, Lincoln Memorial. I did. Back in 2021. Now, a lot of people um, said many things about Anjali. They thought she was an imposter or she's disinformation. You know, one of us, disinformation, quote, unquote. Um, and I can say that, you know, you may not know this, but Anjali was who she said what she was. She was an officer in the Defense Intelligence Agency. And uh, you had her on as a guest. I don't know if she provided you with bona fides, but she, she, was, she sent me. She sent me all of her. I, I don't want to get. Yeah, you uh, don't have to. But but she you you me, were convinced, uh, right? You were convinced that she said she, who she me was. all of. She sent me right. too too much paperwork. Okay, that's and, a good sign. I, that's that's what we government people do. We we inundate you with paperwork. Yes, she um, sent me her ID so, cards and, right, and everything else. Right. Well, you, did you know that Anjali was interviewed uh, by government UAP investigators? I did not. Yes. And also, did you know that um, the reason for doing so was to figure out a way to preserve evidence or documentation from this journey into the cave, which the government knew about? 
and they wanted a chain of custody for any information or any documentation, any evidence in that cave for a customer. And that customer was the UAP task force. And so people who say things about Anjali, you might not take her seriously, but I do, because I know that the government takes her seriously. And when she described her contact with the beings that she described as mantis beings, you know, that resonated with people. And when people have experiences, uh, the government shows up. Look at Chris Bledsoe. You interviewed Chris Bledsoe. I have. There's a guy who was like, uh, uh, had a construction business in Fayetteville, North Carolina, right outside of Fayetteville. Just an ordinary guy. And he had this experience and he related to experience, but something about what he said resonated with the government people working the UAP issue. And so all of a sudden they're knocking on his door. NASA guy came, Jim Simi Vance from CIA came, other people came from the three letter agencies because they took him seriously, especially when he reported the woman in white. Right. So my friend Mick, who you signed the shirt for. I did. Back in the early 2000s, he told me that he had a visitation from the woman in white, the lady in white. He told me this long before anybody knew about Chris Bledsoe. And he said she had a message. She had a message about signs in the sky, about signs in the moon. And it's it's more like, you know, not necessarily a warning or dire warning, but we need to take care of this planet a lot better. And that is the core theme that experiences will relate to you that when they contact these non-human intelligences through their experiences, that's the message that we need to take care of the planet. And to the governments, it's this, you're not taking care of the planet if you have nuclear weapons. And we're gonna show you, we're gonna demonstrate to you that we can shut them all down. So why have them? And so that's a major part of disclosure too. That's a benefit of the disclosure is to finally come to terms with our stewardship of the planet. And I, I hope that's where we all go, is that we got to take care of the earth a lot better than what we're doing now. We're doing a terrible job of it. And I think it's because they share the planet with us. And they've probably shared it longer before we arrived. Yeah, for sure. Here. Yeah, for sure. And so look what we've done. And they give us free will. I think we're they consider us uh, their children. They give us free will. Like any good parent, you don't want to you know, be dictatorial to your children. You want them to learn. But when they find the matches and they start striking them, playing with the cigarette lighter in the house, uh, you slap their hands. And that cigarette lighter is nuclear weapons. And they slapped our hands saying, no, that's where you can't go. Um, and so no, that's, I'm gonna that's see, my hope. I'm going to see if I can take you somewhere where you can't go. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about imaging. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to talk specifically about sensor data or techniques and, and methods. There's no reason to go there, and I, I'm certainly not going to uh, uh, get you in any trouble. But I will talk about imaging. Mm -hmm. um, have you – now, you've seen what is out there in the public, mm -hmm. okay? You've yeah. seen that. Mm -hmm. Have you seen imaging while at the CIA – that was the real deal. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the orbs. That's the orbs, the orb working group. Continue. Um, what they had were images of orbs. And um, it's not any different because it's a light orb. It's any different from what people see uh, visually from the ground. It's a orb of orange light. And that's what we see up in space, the same type of image. It doesn't seem to have a structure. Seems to be that, all okay, energy. Okay. Stop, 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 stop mm -hmm. right there. Stop, 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 stop. There, are you suggesting that the orbs are an energy and not of the physical? Well, like nuts and bolts, rivets. Well, it's not what we call, it's physical, but it's not structured craft. Uh, I don't think difference? it's structured craft. I don't, I don't think it's like um, one of the many classic shapes that people have seen UFOs in. Uh, it, it is a manifestation of some kind of energy. Right. And my personal experience is that it is a manifestation of conscious energy, of the non-human intelligence consciousness. Because when I saw an orb, it communicated with me. And when other people have seen orbs, they communicated with them. How, how clear were these pictures? Um, it was... Orange ball. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, no, it's I, no different. I mean, it's not like, you know, you, 
you draw an orange light orb and it there's no structure to it so it doesn't matter if it's like detailed or not detailed it was an orange orb it was well, just what what i'm referring to john and i'm not being cavalier at all mm -hmm. uh, but what i'm referring to is when you look at uh, the the FLIR imaging or you look yeah. at the Tic Tac video, that yeah. could be anything. It's blurry. It's a second, third, fourth generation shot on a cell phone off of a screen. Or, you know, it's not high. De um, uh, the the other imaging that that we mm -hmm. have seen, even like the Go Fast, you know, you mm -hmm. look at yeah. it, it. It's crap. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm asking you. Is, oh, so yeah. You I mean, at that image, right. it was an image. It was an image of an orange ball of light. And I've seen personally, not through CIA, but personally outside of an uh, airplane window from a flight from uh, Baltimore, Washington International to, uh, I guess, LAX. Um, we're flying over the southwest and outside the right side window, I saw an orange orb also. And that orange orb was noted by the cockpit. And they actually, I was monitoring uh, United Airlines back then on a certain channel. Uh, you can actually hear the air traffic control talking to the cockpit back in the day before 9-11. And so I was monitoring that because I'm such an aircraft geek. I love that. And so the pilot or co-pilot reported to the ground that yeah, there's an object that's uh, crossing my path from left to right and uh, do you have it on radar? And, and the guy said, no, we don't, we don't have anything. And it's now, uh, now past us and it's uh, going to my right. And the guy on the ground says, do you want to report it? And the cockpit said, no, we don't. And I looked out and there it was. It was an now, orange orb. You know what's interesting about that? What oh, is? That's uh, where the Nimitz incident happened. South west of lax is catalina island oh no i was in the southwest of the united states oh i thought you said lax lax uh we were uh it's bwi to lax was the uh trip oh. and on that flight path we were over the southwest united states oh gotcha, gotcha. and the north of us or probably nevada you know everything is kind of strange in nevada right and uh I, you know, one of the things that uh, that I, I think I can say, well, sure, I'll say it. I'll, I'll get the phone call. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that uh, was not talked about was um, like the appearance of these craft from the Arctic Circle going to the Antarctic, pole to pole. Right. Right. And sometimes they would peel off. And so you have two coming down from the north going to the South Pole. And one would continue, and the other would peel off toward Nevada. And the other one would keep going into the Antarctic. And so I would say, you know, that that's probably something that's within the holdings of Errol, because uh, I think that happened uh, under the purview of the UAP task force. They looked at 2004 to 2021. And so I won't say when it happened, but it was between 2004 Tic Tac in 2021, when the report came out, one of the 144, which uh, three we know is uh, Go Fast Gimbal Tic Tac, one was a balloon, and, a, and one of the 140 must have been, uh, or two of the 140 must have been these objects that uh, I think NORAD knew about. And so yeah. going back to Kirkpatrick's, uh, you know, um, briefing or um, testimony in front of the Senate committee, um, they, they have a lot of data. And that goes into the G. That's interesting data. You know, if we go back, uh, you mentioned Chris Bledsoe, mm -hmm. and uh, before that, uh, Tom DeLong only did a couple of of interviews. One of them was here on Fade to Black, mm -hmm. and and I'm so glad we did that interview. It was probably 2016. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right in that area, uh, might have been 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that DeLong said uh, mm -hmm. in that interview it's, has, has stayed with me over the years. And he said, you got to be careful about who you're reaching out to consciously when you mm -hmm. see something in the sky. Mm -hmm. You don't know mm -hmm. who they are or what, 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 you know, what they're about. 
Mm -hmm. We need to be very careful. Mm -hmm. And he said it could be, and now he added this religious context to it. Mm -hmm. And and then Chris Bledsoe comes along, again, orange orbs, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And and brings in this question, uh, his new book, UFO of God. Yeah, Mm -hmm. All right. And and DeLong and and Chris um, and others, and we can talk about Diana Pasolka too as well, and others that um, say that inside of the agencies, inside of the Beltway, inside of the Department of Defense, there is a large chunk of those that feel that this is a religious thing. This could even be demonic, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. something with a bad intention. Yeah. When when you hear that, and you know mm-hmm. about Bledsoe, and certainly Tom DeLong and and others, what do you, what do you have to say? I would say that uh, first of all, um, they were given the moniker Collins Elite. You probably heard that. I don't know if of that's course. what they call themselves. Um, I do know that there was or is a, a group of individuals who are extremely religious, and not to disparage anyone's religion, but they it's a heartfelt belief that what we are witnessing is a manifestation of satanic forces. Now, I don't have to happen to ascribe to that feeling that it's satanic necessarily, but is it strange? Yes, I, I think it's like strange. Uh, they're like manifestations of what some people call the trickster element in all of this, that you know they may disguise themselves as something and not be that. Um, and some people believe that, you know, the mantis beings or the reptilians are like tricksters. And the ones that look like us are, are cool. You know, they're fine. Uh, it could be the other way around. You don't know because of the trickster element. You don't know who's walking through that door. Um, I, I would say this, that um, there, there has been a warning provided to the U.S. government not to go to the dark side, the far side of the moon, the dark side of the moon, that stay away from that dark side and when remote viewers try to remote view the dark side of the moon they encounter these these beings who warn them don't do not ever come back again and then the remote viewer will report that say yes i encountered these non-human intelligences and they said do not come to the far side of the moon ever again um and so there's that what Uh, happened you know what happened today what happened Uh, japan tried to land on the far side of the moon oh did they make it no nope you know who did make it china china and and, yeah and and china check this out their rover Mm -hmm. is now inactive Uh uh-huh they say it's covered in moon dust and it won't run anymore that's Mm -hmm. that's that's their story they're still well it's it's been it's been working for quite some time and so about a year about a year uh israel tried to land there uh Mm -hmm. Uh, they crashed uh, as well, but I've always found that uh, pretty compelling. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. On that side of the moon, since the moon doesn't rotate, uh, the same it does rotate, but the same face is always there. So that's the side we see. Um, you know, if you go on the dark side of the moon, um, you know, you need to communicate to Earth, and you're not going to be able to do it. No, you're not going to be able to do it. And and it's only the dark side of the moon uh, half of the day. It's yeah. lit up just right. like anything else the other right. half of the day. Most right. people don't understand that. Right. They, they That's correct. That. It's yeah. it's only dark to us. It's only dark uh, to because us. we can't see it. Uh, but uh, when we have the new moon up, when it's dark, the side we do see is dark. We don't. We don't. The other side is lit. Uh, so there's that, and you know, I I would say you know it, the beware of of who you who you communicate with. Why do you think, uh, in the short time that we have left, excellent conversation tonight, John, by the way, excellent. Yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it. It's so much fun, so much fun. Um, And by the way, you can send my CIA uh, t-shirt. You need to sign it, though. You need to sign (laughs) it. Is is this, with, um, uh, there seems to be a switch that has been flipped. Mm-hmm. And and I bring that up because the CIA mm-hmm. has their entertainment division. They liaison with Hollywood yeah, and, and other media. This is mm-hmm. go to the CIA website. Right. 
mm-hmm. and, and and look it up. I have uh, mm-hmm. many times because it's very interesting reading. Um, everything from scripts and story ideas, omissions, maybe you need to remove something, maybe you need to add something. Can we mm-hmm. suggest? Um, so there is all of that. Yeah. And then at the same time, uh, the media uh, at all, all mm-hmm. of it, suddenly is is free to discuss this uh, mm-hmm. very important subject where it wasn't like this in the past. Right. Who has flipped this switch? Why is it now okay uh, for the media to to go at this hard and heavy? Um, the, the media could have done it all the time. Uh, I think in the past, um, they may have kowtowed to the intelligence community because they want access to other things, you know, because, you know, as you know, as a journalist, you get deep background information uh, that will help you do your work as a journalist to get stuff that's in the open. So they tell you stuff in a deep background. So this is what's really going on. And then you're clued into, okay, I know what sources to go to in the open source. They don't want that to stop. Um, as a, as a correspondent, you know, you don't want that channel to stop at all to dry up. Um, and so I think that's, that was the leverage that uh, the government had on these journalists, but now, you know, now it, because we want this out in the open, uh, it's, everything is fair game, I think everything's fair game. And I think that's, that's the switch that was thrown was helped by the fact that in 2017, uh, the New York times published that the Pentagon had this so-called secret UFO study group. Um, and that's been in operation since like, like 2007, 2008. Um, that went a long way in the release of those three videos. And so now you have people who feel more comfortable coming forward. And so you have me, you have others, you have Jim Van who went to TTSA. Uh, you have Lou Elizondo doing this thing, Chris Mellon, and, and many, many others who are coming forward and say, well, I don't know everything and I don't know everything, but I won't make up anything I don't know. If I don't know it, I don't know it. Um, and, but we're coming forward with what we do know. Um, in these different types of ways is venues like fade to black where we can share with your audience what we know um, and so that switch was like it's time to share I mean it's why have this monopoly over this information what good is it doing the Air Force can't make what it built fly any higher any faster and stay any more hidden than it is now they're hit a roadblock the brick wall because the people who worked on these projects, they're stovepiped. And as Dr. Eric Davis said, that you know, if you're in a team and you hit a stovepipe and you hit uh, you hit a brick wall and you're in a stovepipe, you can't go to another group to say, help me out, because you don't even know that group exists. So if you're done, you're done. And so there's there's that, you know, there's just no sharing, but now there is. Um, why keep it secret? There's nothing secret about this at all. Is why there... is it secret? I don't know why it's classified other than we're classifying what we derive from the technology. But why is the technology itself secret? It belongs to everyone on the planet. It well, doesn't belong right. to any government. But but that's exactly the point. Mm-hmm. So if if the the line in the sand is crossed, right? This little nugget, like you said, it, mm-hmm. it only has to be this simple. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it, it is happening. Now let's mm-hmm. take it a step further and figure out the who, what, when, where, and why. Yeah. So if that line in the sand is crossed, mm-hmm. do you know something? Will you then come forward? Are there? Well, absolutely. Others? I am. Call me up on the phone. I'm absolutely ready to step forward uh, and, and do whatever I can uh, if, in a more official capacity. Um, to bring this to light. Uh, I am w- re- we- uh, ready and willing to do so. Are and you- if I'm able to talk more about things that I couldn't talk about with you, for example, tonight, right? Um, and if they allow me to, I'm going to tell them anything I can because it's so important for us as the people of Earth to understand our role on this planet. And the possibility that if we come together as a planet and stop fighting these little tribal wars, Right. Which they probably think we're we're so primitive. We're fighting amongst ourselves. Look at these sure. guys. You know they're fighting amongst themselves, no and question. they're going to blow each other up with these nuclear weapons. We get past that, and then we can join them as a space-faring planet. Go out there and explore the universe, 
and then bring technologies that help people on this planet, not the military industrial complex. I don't want to help them because they're just going to like figure out a way to weaponize everything. That's their mindset. Let's make it a weapon and make it better than the other guy's weapon. I don't want that. I'm sick of that. I want us to go forward and progress as humans of this planet Earth together so that we can become a spacefaring nation and explore the rest of the universe and bring technologies back to Earth that can help us with climate, with air pollution, with, you know, everything, even even like cures for diseases, if not. Yeah, sure, um, sure, sure. And, you know, everything like that. So I think that's that's the goal we should have. And I don't want like any particular flag to be planted claiming that as a monopoly. Are you are you protected uh, by the amendments? Do you feel? I feel very protected. Absolutely. Uh, the legislation in the AA? Yes. Absolutely. Um, and that's why I'm a little more bold in what I reveal. Uh, than I did when uh, in 2021, when I didn't think the legislation was strong enough. It is now strong enough that I feel very much protected. Uh, I know that um, the the People's House of Representatives and the Senate ha have my back, that I am protected by the laws of the United States of America, which the military industrial complex also need to follow and not ignore. Well, okay, so 25 years, I'm assuming you've got, you know, your, your retirement package yeah. and and all of that, that's a, a, a considerate, your family and everything mm -hmm. else, and you got to yeah. keep the lights on. Sure. Um, you don't want that jeopardized. Oh. It, it, do you think that that no. is enough motivation for others to go ahead and come forward, maybe speak uh, to to Congress or speak on Capitol Hill, speak to the Senate? Yes. And, 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 and be very frank and open? To be very frank, yes. And in fact, I'm, I don't feel jeopardized at all because CIA does not control my retirement salary. It's, it's, it goes to the Office of Personal Management, which controls the retirements of the entire federal workforce. So CIA has nothing to do with what I earn as a retiree of the CIA. It's in the Office of Personal Management and in the Social Security Administration. And I happen to have an IRA with my bank. So there's my sources of income. And uh, for others, uh, Kirkpatrick... Uh, if you look at the transcript of what he said, he said there were like 24 people that he has spoken to that come forward to talk to Errol. Very important statement that he made, by the way. Yeah. Uh, not enough attention was paid to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did, did, were you one of those 24? No. I, as I stated before, I did receive a way to contact him directly, but I didn't feel like I needed to. Um because um, I felt like, you know, I don't really have any more information that he could use that he already has. Uh, believe me, Errol has a lot of information that came from the UAP task force, that came from ATIP, that came from um, ALSAP and other government efforts into studying uh, this entire uh, subject matter. So he has that. He has a big repository and his challenge is trying to go through it and resolve all of the cases that he has. That's this thing, you know, that's where I, the discussion went toward, you know, do you have enough people? Do you have staffing? What do you need? Do you have cooperation? Senator Gilbert says, what can I do to help your make your job easier? What laws can I write to make your job easier? Yeah, she said, I'll write I mean, you a letter right now. I'll well, start yeah, right yeah, now. yeah, you know, he has a small staff. And so that's why he has to go back to the major agency and says, okay, this is Errol's problem. This is your problem. But you owe us an answer. You do the work and you give us the answer. And one so last, that's what he calls somebody else's problem. You know, but that's what he meant. One last question. But sure. I'm saving the best for last, John. All right. The the Wilson Davis uh, oh, yeah. memo and document. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I believe that it's an authentic document. It's notes from a conversation. So that yeah. part of it, it's 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 an authentic. It's not a yeah. government document. It doesn't have yeah. a document number. Yeah. It, it's not classified. Personal notes. Yeah. It's personal, personal notes. Personal notes. Sure. But do you believe that those that the conversation happened between uh, Thomas Wilson? and uh, Dr. Eric Davis, the way it was presented in those notes. If those are Eric Davis's notes, uh, the man is honest to a T. Um, he actually applied for a job at CIA and I got his application papers. 
uh, in my office when I was a branch chief. Really? Um, I couldn't, I could not hire him. Um, he, was, he was basically overqualified as a PhD in physics. I just need a guy with a master's degree. And I thought he would be bored. Uh, I regret that decision because um, soon, soon after his application paper came and I rejected it, um, I needed to send people to the uh, ORB working group. And he would have been ideal to send to the ORB working group. It would not surprise me that he actually was a participant in that working group because that followed into OSAP, which he did participate in. Uh, he, this guy is as honest as you can have. I mean, you, you, the guy has cannot lie, I don't think. Very honest person. And if he says he does not acknowledge that he wrote them, I don't think. But I think he will. I think there will be information coming out that those notes were real. And that well, conversation part of the there, record, really, it's part, part really, of the congressional record. Right, it, it's part, but that doesn't say it's real. It's like, it say it's real. Let's, let's read it into the record and it's part of the congressional record. So at least there's that. Um, I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Davis would be one of the people that will come forward. Well, he, he I, I would say that he has to. And he mm -hmm. has to, for one, uh, the quote attributed to him in the New York Times that he said he briefed the Senate about us mm -hmm. having flying saucers, number one. Uh -huh. uh, but number two, the 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 whole document's interesting, no, no question yeah. about it. But the, the one section there where he's got uh, Admiral Rear, uh, Admiral Wilson, talking about his conversation uh, with a private company out here, we've all kind of deduce that it's skunk works um, and that where they said, we've got a craft. Mm -hmm. We, we think it can fly, but we can't get this thing up in the air. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and now yeah. That, that, that right there, I think there's some testimony that needs to take place. Uh, did that conversation uh, really happen right, with right. Eric? And of course, uh, Admiral Wilson, I think, should come right. forward too and testify to that as well. Yeah, yeah, I have some personal thoughts about that, which I can't prove. But if you want my personal thoughts, uh, I think I do think we have craft that can fly, but it's not an alien reproduction vehicle. Uh, if we have a craft that can't fly, it's not nothing we would build because if we build something, it's going to fly, even if it has plain old jet engines in it. It's sure. going to fly. Sure, and it may have some magneto you know, hydrodynamic drive. MHD, um, something exotic like that. It could have scramjets. That's another exotic propulsion technology. Uh, it may have that, but it's going to fly. Um, but if we have something that can't fly, that tells me, reading behind the lines, that it's a fully formed, intact, non-crashed vehicle that they can't make work. And so that's where I would go, hmm, that's interesting. It's either at Skunk Works or... Let's not forget Boeing Phantom Works. It's the other partner in crime. Uh, so everybody looks at Skunk Works, but there's also Phantom Works. And Northrop Grumman has their own little thing going on as well. And so those three contractors, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, and uh, uh, Lockheed Martin, those are the three aerospace contractors. And, and let's not forget uh, uh, Air Force Plant 42. 42, well. yeah, exactly, near, near Palmdale, where... Yeah, uh, you're very I, familiar with that place. I don't, you know, it's yeah. funny. When, I, when I have guests over at the house, John, yeah. yeah, they don't want to come in and see my guitars. Ah, they want to <laughs> go down the street, man. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'll take them. I'll take them to the front gates of uh, Air Force Plant 42. Uh -huh. And uh, they have a little museum right there. Yeah. But uh, but the gate and what mm -hmm. you see, the, there's like three lines of fences with it's like a prison it's it's, it's crazy yeah but you look at that and you're just thinking you're just, whatever's going on over there yeah is crazy town yeah you don't put this up right you know uh, <laughs> you know to keep the coyotes out right exactly no, no yeah it's, yeah, it's, yeah yeah so hey john thank you so much my friend uh thank you for uh not only being very candid uh, but supporting the community and and hanging out with us tonight. Great conversation, and I certainly look forward to our next one. And hopefully, hopefully you don't get that phone call tonight. And yes. Big shout out to Mick. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, Mick. Yeah. Great guy. Great guy. And uh, by the way, are you going to be a contact in the desert? I am not. I oh, am. Not. Yeah. Okay. It's the first one that I won't be hosting. Oh, but yeah. 
I've got another event on the East right. Coast that uh, was booked last year, a private okay. thing. Yeah, I was going to get you a, 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 an authentic CIA T-shirt from the employee store and a hat. <laughs> well, I was going to bring it with me, but maybe I can I can arrange to have it sit, sit we, to you. We will. Uh, let's talk off the air. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you more. Okay. Right. Okay. John, thank you so much, my friend. Be safe out there. Thank you. John Ramirez. That, my friends was a perfect night on fade to black. And uh, now I want to remind everyone, John, John runs, he doesn't have any of that social media and all that other stuff. But if you need to get a hold of John or you got anything to say, you can do that through me, not a problem. Um, and uh, what a great way to kick off this week here on fade to black tomorrow night. Richard Bleepin Dolan is with us. I want to thank John Ramirez again. Getting out there and doing what he's doing right now for our community. It's a big part of where we are and how we are moving forward. Thank you so much, John. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Renee, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Richard Dolan, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.